continues on page one in your worship bulletin. <clears throat> Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And let us all say together the Gloria. Glory, Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world. Have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father.
be with you. And also with you. Also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whom truly to know is everlasting life, grant us so perfectly to know your Son, Jesus Christ, to be the way, the truth, and the life, that we may steadfastly follow his steps in the way that leads to eternal life. <clears throat> Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of the last <laughs> reading from the Acts of the Apostles. An angel of the Lord said to Philip, Get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, Queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home. Seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you're reading? He replied, how can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, like a lamb silent before its shearer so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask you, does this prophet say this, about himself or about someone else? Then Philip began to speak and started with this scripture. He proclaimed to him the news, the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all of the towns until he be came to Caesarea. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We will read the, res the psalm responsively by half verse. My praise is of him in the great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall bow before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord. He rules over the nations. To him alone, all who sleep in the earth bow down in worship. All who go down to the dust fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. 
They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the same deeds that he has done. A reading from the first book of John. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior to the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God. And God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said to his disciples, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always found acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> this morning, we're still in the Gospel of John. I love that Gospel. It's slightly different in its layout and in its message from the other three Gospels, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, which are referred to as the synoptic Gospels because the Greek word synopsis means uh, a telling of the way in which Jesus actually performed and lived out his public ministry for three years. It's a synopsis of the acts that Jesus performed, the teachings and the miracles that Jesus performed. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke do a very good job of capturing in synoptic form what Jesus did for those three years of his public ministry. The Gospel of John was written later than the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And they appeal to a slightly different audience. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke appeal primarily to a Jewish audience because that's where the Christian faith originated from. It grew out of the fact that Jesus himself was Jewish and that he spoke mostly, not all the time, but mostly to a Jewish audience. By the time the Gospel of John is written, about 90 AD, Christianity had begun to spread to other parts of the Mediterranean basin, thanks in no small measure to the work of the Apostle Paul. Paul was the great apostle to the Gentiles, and the Gentiles were the people who didn't speak uh, Hebrew as much as they spoke Greek. And John's Gospel is appealing to those who were not raised as Jews and who spoke Greek and were familiar with some of the Greek way of approaching the gods. So of its very core and of its very nature, the Gospel of John is slightly different from the other three Gospels. It's uh, more mystical in a way because the Greek world, the Greek speaking world, had dealt more over the centuries with mysticism. And in today's Gospel passage, we're finding that Jesus gives what's called the last discourse. And it's a lengthy part of the Gospel of John just before Jesus goes into Jerusalem and meets his fate on the cross and subsequently is resurrected by God. So this part about Jesus saying, I am the vine, you are the branches, is delivered to a small group of his followers, the apostles in particular, and it is meant to give them an understanding of how they are in the way of not only being Jewish, because all of the early apostles were Jews, but also how to spread the gospel to those who are not Jewish. And so Jesus uses an analogy, 
about who he is that all of the early apostles, indeed all of the people would recognize, and for the most part we recognize today, even those of us who have lived in urban areas where there are no vineyards available. Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. Now when that image came to the apostles' mind, no doubt, the first thing they thought of were grapes because the water wasn't exactly up to the standards that we enjoy today. And so the primary beverage that people consumed in very careful quantities was wine. And so the growing and the cultivation of grapes was extraordinarily important. And Jesus knew that he knew that his early apostles, as well as almost all of the people in the Mediterranean basin, understood about the nature of a vine and how it grew up and it sprouted branches that would periodically have to be pruned. And he uses that analogy as a way of communicating the, uh, the oneness, if you will, between God and the rest of us. Because, make no mistake about it, one of the things that the early apostles clearly got when Jesus used this message or metaphor of him as the vine and they as the branches is that there is no distance in effect between the divine and the human, that somehow or another, they were partly divine because they were connected to God in this analogy or metaphor of the vine and the branches. It's inescapable, and it should be inescapable for us as well. There is a part of us by dint of our birth, by dint of our living in this cosmos that we live in, created by God, that has the divine within us. And Jesus talks about that as a way of honoring what humanity can be at its best. What Jesus does, in my mind, is what every great, host or hostess of a party does. And if you're at a really great party, it's not the quantity of wine that makes a party great. It is the way that you feel in the presence of the host and hostess that elevates you to performing and being your best. That's what makes a party great. I've yet to hear somebody say, oh, that was a great party and I was at my worst. We say it's a great party, a great social occasion, because somehow or another in the very air of that party, the, air, the very air that we breathe even more than in the very wine that we drink, we become our best. And that's what Jesus wants out of his followers. It's not so much that Jesus desires us to remain as sinners. Jesus calls his people constantly, even to this very day, to a new standard of living that brings true life. And you know that from your own lives. Now, Faith is a developmental process, and you don't always get that right at first. It takes some time. But this analogy of the vine and the branches can be told in different ways. And in the uh, 21st century, I believe, Rick Warren wrote this book, The Purpose Driven Life, that many of you have I can tell by the way you're nodding. Many of you have read, 
learned and inwardly digested, Rick Warren talks about the purpose-driven life, a life that brings us a sense of quality about it by developing the following characteristics. He enumerates them, and there are five of them, and I couldn't memorize all five, so today I need a cheat sheet. <laughs> Rick Warren says, the most important characteristic of being a human being and living a purpose-driven life is to love God. And the way that you do that is through worship. That's why, whether you like coming to church on Sunday mornings or not, you still need a place in your life to worship God. Indeed, other religions, other world religions, don't stress, like we do, the importance of coming to church to worship, but they have their own shrines, their own places of worship in their houses. My wife spent some time in Japan, and the Japanese people do that. They have their own shrines, their own way of worshiping God. So what Rick Warren is saying is the most important thing about becoming a human being, in other words, in order to become alive, is to love God and to worship God, as Jesus quotes with all of your heart and soul and mind and strength. The second thing, if you want to be in that vine and in that vitality that Jesus is speaking about, is to be part of God's family, which is to say, in fellowship with one another. I want to spend a little bit of time speaking about that because we have a relationship with God on the one hand that is vertical. It rises between us and God, and that part is very important. But don't forget about the horizontal part. The horizontal part is to be in community with one another. It forms a cross. So our relationship with God is incomplete if it's just simply vertical. If it's just you and me, God, we're missing something. It needs to be fleshed out by the horizontal aspect of faith development. It needs to be made in the form of a cross. We need to interact with one another and to learn from one another and to grow from one another in our spiritual development. That's just the way it is. We can't do it all on our own. And I'm always skeptical at those who say, well, I just go out into the woods on Sunday morning and worship all by myself. My sense is, is that that is an incomplete expression of how to worship God and how to become fully human. We need the sense of community. One of the great dons, that is to say, the uh, great leaders of the Church of England was a man who was named John Donne. John Donne was, uh, a, 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 well, they didn't call them priests, they called them ministers back in those days, in England. And he was the famous author of the poem, No Man is an Island. You may recognize that from uh, a Paul Simon song. No man is an island. John Donne recognized that we need to live in community. For all of your warts, I need you. And for all of my warts, you need me. That's the way it is. The third thing that Rick Warren talks about is to become like God. Remember earlier I said that if you're in this analogy or metaphor of being in a vine and being a branch of that vine, you also have to realize 
with some amount of fear and trepidation, I might say, that there is a part of you that is very holy and very sacred. And that's what Rick Warren is talking about. The way that we cultivate the fact that we are part of the divine is by discipleship. We're not the only ones who are a part of the divine. In fact, the more you cultivate that third step in what Rick Warren is talking about, the more you realize that all that is created by God is holy. It is sacred. One of the great, great writers of, of Christianity in America in the 20th century was a monk named Thomas Merton. Thomas Merton's most famous writing was uh, uh, The Seven Story Mountain, which was his autobiography. But he also had a lot of other writings as well. He was out of a place, a monastery in Kentucky called Gethsemane. Some of you may have been there. And Thomas Merton said, everything that is, is holy. Now that makes for the insight of a saint to recognize everything that is, is holy. There is a spot within me that is holy. And there's a spot within you, Jan, that's holy. And when we respect that, when we bring that out in the other person, then we're living in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Instead of dwelling on that which is not holy, we can dwell on that which is holy and cultivate it. Because it needs to be cultivated. The fourth thing, that Rick Warren talks about is to serve God, which is manifested in what we call ministry. I'm proud to say that over the years, the Episcopal Church has time and time again stressed the fact that ministry is not just done by people who wear funny-looking collars. Ministry is what we all do we minister to one another because we rec recognize that if we're to be followers of Jesus, then just as Jesus was a servant leader, so also are we called to be servant leaders. You know, if your husband was a doctor and you're a nurse, back in the days when doctors and nurses actually went to people's houses when they were sick, you're acting in the role of a servant leader. To serve others is to spark something within your soul that makes you come alive. So that's the fourth thing that Rick Warren talks about. To serve God through acts of ministry. And the final thing is to tell others about God. It is the gift of evangelism. Nowhere is that better expressed than in the first reading, which I must say, Noni did a fabulous job in reading today. The first reading is about how Philip ministered to someone who had no idea about who Jesus of Nazareth was. But Philip talked to this eunuch from Ethiopia, about Jesus of Nazareth and how he was the fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures. That is what Philip did in terms of telling others about God and acting in an evangelical way. So those are the five points that Rick Warren makes. I think they're well made. To love God, to be part of God's family, to become like God, to serve God, 
and to tell others about God. May we do our best to fulfill all five of those parts of our lives, and in so doing, become alive in the Lord. Amen. Now let us stand and say aloud together the Nicene Creed, found on page 5. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us, for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. vigor to the day, dispelling the darkness and greeting us with a new dawn. In response to this gift, let us offer our prayers, responding, hear us, God of glory. That the leaders and the peoples of the world may receive the gift of divine peace, welcoming its transforming power making room for all to be refreshed by saving springs. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. That we may embrace God's generosity, sharing with others the fare that is on our table, offering garments that rest upon our shoulders, giving money for the relief of those in need, that no child be hungry, no person live without shelter, and all people have ready access to education, health care, and employment. Let us pray. Hear our God of glory. For the sick and, any, and those in any need, especially Jack, Jamie, John, Caleb, Paula, Derek, Cookie, Jay, Nicole and family, Ken and Mary Lynn, Rick and Creed, Sharon, Barbara, Karen, Colleen, Cindy, Tom, and Eric. Right, Caroline. Hear us, God of glory. For the courage to pray for those who annoy us and those who slander our good name and who utter false judgments against us, that we may hear above the noise of the crowd the voice of the one who is the good shepherd of our souls and in whom we place our trust. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. For the church especially this congregation, that we may find within ourselves a generosity of spirit 
that will renew our community of faith, let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. For those who celebrate those who celebrating their birthday this week, and for those celebrating their wedding anniversary, let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. For those serving as missionaries in faraway places, and those serving in the military throughout the world, that in the midst of loneliness, they may know themselves to be bound to Christ whose presence never fades, and whose care is both daily and eternal. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. That those who have died may find fellowship in that place where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Let us pray. Hear us, God of glory. Sustained by the hope and confidence that comes to us from God, let us continue our prayers silently. Almighty God, hear the prayers of your people, and in your divine wisdom and love for us, acknowledge we humbly beseech you those prayers which we offer unto you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And now, kneeling as you are able, let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors and our sorrows. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy on you. Forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Keep you in eternal life. Amen. Would you please stand? The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Please exchange the peace with one another. Oh. 
Congress continues on page 8 with the Eucharistic Prayer 3. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst out from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of Blessing. All you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so, as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we say with joy, Holy, 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 Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the heights. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the heights. Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called the people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life, to proclaim the coming of your holy reign, and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you, and restored us to the glory you intend for us. We thank you that on the night before he died for us, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends, and said, Take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends, and said, Drink this, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. And so remembering all that was done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection and ascension, longing for Christ coming in glory, and presenting to you these gifts your earth has formed and human hands have made, we acclaim you, O Christ. Dying to destroy our death, rising to restore our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ, and in the fullness of time gather us with blessed Michael and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Hmm. Alleluia, Christ our Passover.
Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us be to peace. Hallelujah. My sisters and brothers, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. No need the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. <clears throat> All are invited to come forward and receive Holy Communion. <clears throat> William, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven, and they in the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. the bread of heaven.
that we are living members of the body of your Son, and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to give to you and to the Holy Spirit the honor and glory, now and forever. May the Creator bless you and keep you. May the beloved compassion of Jesus Christ have mercy upon you. And may the Eternal Spirit's countenance be turned to you and give you peace. And may the three in one bless you. Amen. 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 Rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Thanks to God. Alleluia.